Well, again, welcome to the hills. If you're watching online or in person at one of our three campuses, we're a church in Texas, and I love Texas. I've lived most of my life in Texas. But this week on an early morning jog, God gave me a revelation about Texas. You see, most of my life, I thought that the Garden of Eden was probably somewhere in Texas. But the Lord gave me a revelation because it says in Genesis 3, verse 8, that the Lord walked in the garden in the cool of the day. There is no cool of the day in Texas and won't be for the next several months. So Adam and Eve were not placed in Texas, but we all know that is where Jesus is going to return, and we can't wait for that. So before I begin my teaching, uh, I want you to know that uh, in the month of July, I typically take a study break and I go and visit church planters. I'll be visiting four different church planters in the next several weeks. Now, Taylor is going to do his usual July series. It's called Highs and Lows. He's going to be looking at the different emotions that God endorses in worship in the Psalms. But next Sunday, we're going to do something we did last year. We're calling it Communicator Sunday. We've got a slate of speakers, eight different speakers at our eight different services. Look at that picture and notice the diversity. We got every generation represented. We got different races represented. We have the genders represented. There's a reason. Acts chapter 2, it's very clear that God's prophecy was fulfilled, that God is going to pour out the Spirit on the church, and He's going to pour it out on young and old, on every tribe and tongue, on men and women. And God gifts all the ages and all the races and all the genders words of encouragement to build up the church. So next week, you'll have your choice of what service to go to. My dilemma is I want to hear all eight in person. I probably can only make it to three of them. You might want to go to more than one, but we're excited about next Sunday, and you are going to receive a blessing. Now, I must confess, of all the series I've preached, this last 10 weeks working through the Sermon on the Mount has felt the most awkward to me. I'm preaching on the preaching of Jesus, as if somehow I could improve on what he said. If you've seen me play golf, you know I do not need to give Tiger Woods swing tips. If you've heard me sing, you know I don't need to give Adele voice lessons. What am I doing preaching the preaching of Jesus like somehow I could make it better? Perhaps the smartest thing for the last 10 weeks would have just been to get up, read the Sermon on the Mount, and then say, now go do that. In fact... That is exactly how Jesus closed his sermon. And it is the smartest thing you can do. So follow with me in Matthew 7, starting verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruits you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. You see... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now, even if you don't think Jesus is the Son of God, you have to admit he is a brilliant communicator. 
And throughout this sermon, he has employed a rhetorical device called contrast over and over. In chapter 5, Jesus said there's two kinds of righteousness, and he gave you six examples of what he talks about. In chapter 6, he talks about two treasures, two masters, two ways to think about tomorrow. And now, in chapter 7, he closes the sermon with four sets of contrast. He talks about two different roads, two kinds of prophets illustrated by two kinds of trees. He talks about two kinds of judgment on discipleship, and then he closes with two different ways to build a life. And what Jesus has made clear is there's no third option. He doesn't say, well, actually, there's three roads, there's three kinds of trees, there's three ways to build a house. What Jesus is saying is, there's my way, and there's all the other ways, and you have to make a choice. The sermon is closing with a decision. You have to choose to be a part of the kingdom community Jesus is building. And you got to understand, a lot of the people listening to him hadn't done that yet. Let's go back and look at who was listening to the greatest sermon ever. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. You see, there's two groups there. There's the masses And then there are the people that have specifically decided to follow Jesus. He had a lot of admirers, but not as many followers. He still does. It's very hard to find anybody that will say something ugly about Jesus. Almost everybody says nice things about Jesus and about what he taught. But Jesus closes the greatest sermon ever with an absolutely startling assessment. If all you do is listen and decide you like me, then you are foolish. Let me remind you, we don't call it the suggestions on the mount. Jesus is preaching like a king who has come to set up a kingdom. And 2,000 years before Nike, Jesus said, just do it. I think the whole key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount is a verse we just read. You see the whole sermon through the lens of this one verse. In chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Notice Jesus said, I'm not interested in you liking the sermon. I'm not interested in you Taking notes on the sermon. I'm really not interested in you taking phrases from the sermon and putting them on your favorite t-shirt or coffee mug. I'm interested in you actually doing what I said. The emphasis is not on understanding. It's on undertaking. Jesus says wisdom is the difference between knowing and doing. This is true throughout the Bible. In the Bible, the wise person is the one who takes divine truth and actually applies it to their life. Let me give you an illustration. You see a picture now of two men. The taller man's named Will Haney. He's a mayor of a town in South Carolina. He had a problem. When the vaccines became available for COVID, people were getting in line, and the lines were over an hour long, and people were not coming because it took so long. So he called his friend Jerry. You already know where I'm going with this. Jerry was the manager of the local Chick-fil-A. So Jerry came, saw the problem. Quickly, he had that hour-long wait down to 15 minutes. Why did he ask the local Chick-fil-A manager? Because he got a track record of knowing how to apply wisdom to life. You see, Jesus is saying, you don't get extra credit for liking my sermon. Living his sermon is what he wants and what he expects. And that's where we have a problem and a huge disconnect between what Jesus preached and cultural Christianity. Because the sad reality today in our culture is that you can be a Christian and you don't have to do what Jesus said. That in our culture, you can claim citizenship in the kingdom. And you don't have to pay attention to the king. We said in the very first sermon of this series, vampire Christianity 
is popular. People that want Jesus for his blood. They want to use Jesus to get into heaven. But they don't choose Jesus as the one whom they will order their everyday life. They think there's a third option. There's the road for the radical Christians. There's the road for all the unbelievers. And then there's this big wide road for the rest of us that like Jesus most of the time. And Jesus said, if that's what you think, you are a fool. Followers of Jesus are called to be smarter than that. We're not just professors. We are practicers. You can listen to the sermon and like Jesus, but you can't be like Jesus unless you put his words into practice. So Jesus closes the sermon with four contrasts of what he means, putting his words into practice. And here's the first, that if you do what Jesus says, you are going to travel a road not many other people take. Putting Jesus' words into practice is the road less traveled. Remember, he is not in the sermon comparing agnostics and atheists to believers. He's comparing admirers to followers. And what he's saying is the camp of admirers is always going to be larger. They're on a wide road. Now, let me illustrate what I mean. I'm just going to walk through the Sermon on the Mount and see if this kind of Christianity sounds familiar to you. Oh, I like Jesus. I got a temper. (laughs) I always had a temper. I was born with a temper. That's not going to change. I like Jesus. I struggle with lust. Deal with porn now and then. Hey, I'm just a dude. That's what dudes do. But I like Jesus. And yeah, I've been in and out of a few marriages. You know, I figure God just wants me to be happy. Sometimes you just have to treat things as disposable. But I like Jesus. Don't you be getting in my face. Don't you be slapping my cheek. I will let you have it. I take nothing off nobody. But I like Jesus. Now, I am not going to love some kinds of people. I'm not going to go there. I know what Jesus said, but (laughs) I don't think he meant it. And I'm not forgiving that person for what they did. I don't think he meant that either. And I'm all about making all the money I can, because frankly, when I have a lot of money, I feel safe and secure. Although I'll admit it, I'm constantly freaking out about tomorrow. But I'm better than most of the people I know. In my judgment. Now did I just describe what. A lot of unbelievers. Know about Christianity. Comedian. Louis C.K. said this. I have a lot of beliefs. I live by none of them. That's just the way I am. They're just my beliefs. I like believing them. I like that part. They're my little believies. They make me feel good about who I am. But if they get in the way of a thing I want, I just go ahead and do whatever I want. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is describing a path, a road that people in his kingdom go on. And he says, It's got a narrow gate. There's not enough room to get on that path for your will and my will to squeeze through. So so your desire for self-sovereignty is going to have to be squeezed out. And you keep reading in the Gospel of Matthew and you realize Jesus is on a road headed to a cross. And the more people realized that, the less crowded the road behind him got. Because if you take up your cross and follow Jesus, you are the ultimate non-conformist. Now, I'm going to do something I wasn't planning to do. 
I'm not, uh, I'm not a coward because I don't have to do this. I'm going to be gone for the next five weeks and I could have just skipped this. But I feel like I need to talk about a couple of things that happened in Washington recently. One was the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. They did not outlaw abortion. They send it back to the states. Some states are going to be more permissive in abortion law. Some are going to be more restrictive. Now, I have for 33 years as this church's preacher consistently said, I believe life begins in the womb. I believe life belongs to God and the child in the womb should be protected. I am stridently pro-life. But hear me. I'm not pro-birth. I'm pro-life. So I care for that child and that mother after the birth as much as before. That's why, for example, we partner with an organization, and my wife has even volunteered for Pregnancy Help for You, because children and women need health care after the birth, not just before. That's why we encourage in our church people to foster children, because we're pro-life. That's why we send children in the inner city to camp. That's why we partner with organizations to get women in the sex industry out who have children to support because we're pro-life. What that means for me is that I care about the child in the womb and I care about the child on the border and I care about the child at the under-resourced school. And I care about the mother who needs access to good health care. And I care about the woman who had an abortion and is dealing with great trauma because I'm pro-life, not just pro-birth. Now, I suspect for some whose allegiance is primarily to a party, I offended you. So let me be an equal opportunity offender. Another thing happened in Washington last week that I personally applaud. There was the passing of legislation for gun reform. Now, I am all for you responsible gun owners. Hunting, shooting, skeet, going to shooting ranges. That's awesome. What I do not understand is how people feel threatened by legislation that says a disturbed teenager should not have easy access to assault rifles that only are created to help kill people quickly. Now, you know why I take that position? Because I am stridently pro-life. Now, here's the irony. The power mongers in neither political party want me because I'm not selectively pro-life. I'm consistently pro-life. Now, these are my opinions. I'm not speaking for you or for the church. And if you have a problem with them for the next five weeks, I know David Meyer would love to hear about it. (laughs) But here's what I'm learning. That when I try to apply the teaching of Jesus, I constantly wind up on a narrow road. Not on a wide road where everybody wants to be but on a very narrow road, trying to do what Jesus said. And here's the temptation to the right and the left. How can we compromise Jesus and modify Jesus to make the road wider and more appealing to the culture? Whether it's his sexual ethics or what he said about money. How can we make Jesus more popular to the culture? Listen, our focus is not on the the width of the road, To get more people on it, the focus is on the worth of the one we're following. So, I have learned that if I am serious about putting Jesus' words into practice, I'm going to spend most of my life on a road less traveled. I'm okay with that. My king is worth it. Second thing, if I put Jesus' words into practice, it's going to be the evidence of prophetic anointing. Because right after he talked about the robes, he said, now watch out for false teachers. Recognize them by their fruit. Here's the reason a lot of people get on the wrong road. False teachers led them there. You see, 
Leaders can be hard to recognize because their foundation is typically hidden from view. So Jesus said, examine their fruit. What fruit? Sermon on the Mount. Ask yourself of your spiritual leaders, do they practice the Sermon on the Mount? Men and women that are serious about putting Jesus' words into practice don't endorse sexual sin and they don't cover up sexual abuse. When yet church has godly leaders, they don't build empires to themselves so they can get absurdly rich off church people. Godly leaders don't pursue political power at all costs, even their convictions and their integrity. Godly leaders don't compromise Jesus' ethical demands to appease cultural agendas. If the church wants leaders that will direct them down the narrow road, we're going to have to value character more than charisma obedience more than competence, following skills more than leading skills. I've been a pastor for over 40 years, and I've known thousands of pastors. And not one time has a pastor ever said in an interview with the church, he was asked this question, do you follow the Sermon on the Mount? Now, I have not been in a church interview for 33 years. Thank you, Lord. I was in a lot in the first 10 years I was a preacher. I would be asked about my work ethic. I'd be asked about what salary I needed. I'd be asked all kinds of questions about doctrinal controversies. Not one time was I ever asked about my prayer life. About how I treated my wife. Or my neighbor. Or if I had a relationship with God. And then I came 33 years ago and I met with the elders of what was in the Richland Hills Church of Christ. First question was a man named Lynn Lovell. He asked me, I want to know about your relationship with God and what was the last profound encounter you had with Him and the Holy Spirit. They had me right there. They could have... They could have had me for half what they paid me. I didn't tell them that. (laughs) You want to know if I have a relationship with God? That's the most important thing. See, it's impossible to be appointed for church leadership and not be anointed in church leadership. Jesus says, watch out for your leaders. Check their fruit. Because he's going to. See, that's the third thing Jesus said. That putting Jesus' words into practice is how Jesus keeps score. So, there's a man in England named Dean Gunther. He's a well-known tattoo artist. He had a special request recently. I hope this picture doesn't gross you out. But there's this guy that says, I want to look fit, but I hate working out. I want you to tap me some abs. (laughs) So he looks fit, but he's not. Isn't it true that appearances can be deceiving? And that is Jesus' point in one of the most pointed things he ever said. For me, one of the most difficult passages in the Sermon on the Mount and in the, all the Gospels is one I want us to read again. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. And by the way, one thing false prophets will try to teach is that there is no judgment. Now, Jesus consistently taught in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Gospels, there is a coming judgment. That there are eternal consequences for not listening to Jesus. If that's not true, he has no credibility. Jesus said there are dire consequences for ignoring him, for calling him Lord, but not submitting to his lordship. But here's my confusion. They're doing awesome things in your name. They're prophesying in your name. They're casting out demons in your name. They're doing miracles in your name. And Jesus doesn't deny these things are happening. 
So there's two things to remember. Number one, the name of Jesus is powerful. <laughs> we have no idea in the unseen spiritual world how much demons shudder when they hear the name of Jesus. But number two, when miracles happen, it's because God is merciful. It's not because of the merit of the person asking for them. And that's the good news. I get up every Sunday and I pray, Lord, you know that you need to anoint this message because you're good, not because I am. Okay? And so I honestly believe there are people out there that have gotten saved and have gotten healed under the ministries of phonies. Because God is so good, and when people are desperate for God, and they call out for God, He's not going to deny them His mercy just because of a phony. But here's what Jesus is saying. He's not denying miracles, their availability or their reality. What He's saying is, just seeing a miracle doesn't mean that person knows me. If they do what they know, I said they know me. Jesus said, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for casting out anger and lust from your heart. Here's the miracle I'm looking for. Giving undeserved mercy and forgiveness to people in your life who don't deserve it. Here's the signs and wonders I'm looking for. Loving your enemies and refusing to worship the gods of money and worry. Jesus said, I'm looking for a kind of righteousness that can't be tatted on, but it comes from the inside because you've surrendered to the Holy Spirit. That's all that's going to matter then. And it makes all the difference right now because the last thing Jesus said was putting my words into practice is a way to build a life that will last. That when I obey Jesus, I don't just have confidence for life after death. I have resilience in life before death. And so he closes with an illustration about two house builders. Now, the thing is, Jesus built houses. We know he was a carpenter or a stonemason. He built houses. And you got to know that in Jesus' world around Galilee, the soil is sandy, and it gets baked and hard. And you can put heavy things on it. You can build a house on that hard, baked sand, and it will stand up until rainy season. Now the much harder, longer, more expensive thing to do is dig through that hard baked sand a couple of feet and get down to the bedrock and build your house there. And by the way, isn't it interesting that Jesus said there's no place you can build a house that won't have storms. Jesus never said, if you will follow me, you won't have any problems in life. He never guaranteed a storm-free life. He guaranteed a storm-proof life. So one of my favorite preachers is Dr. Tony Evans. He spoke at our most recent men's conference. He and his wife, before she passed away, went on a cruise to Alaska. And they got in the midst of a terrible storm. Huge waves, furniture moving, people getting sick. And he said his wife was evangelically upset. And demanded to talk to the captain of the ship. And she got on the phone to call the bridge. And said, let the captain know I, I am angry that he got us into this storm. He should have seen it coming. We should be avoiding this. And I'm really, really upset. A few minutes later in the cabin, they get a call from an associate of the captain. The captain heard your message. And he said to tell you two things. Number one, he's at the wheel. And he'll be here all night so you can go to sleep. And number two, this boat was built with this storm in mind. That when they were building this boat, they anticipated this kind of storm. The storm is bad, but the boat is better. We all know that life is hard. Nobody I'm talking to right now has had an easy life. We all have seasons of life that are stormy. We all know Christians that have been through storms and their faith collapsed. And they got mad at God and said, if you were really a good God, you wouldn't let my life be so hard. We all know Christians who've been through equally and even 
harder storms. And their faith is still standing. What's the difference? Jesus said it's not what they heard. It's what they did. Liking Jesus will not build a life that lasts. Living like Jesus will. And so Jesus closes the greatest sermon ever with a call for decision. Are you going to go the way of the fool? Or are you going to get smart? That's how he started his public ministry. And here's how he ended it the night before he died. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And when God builds your home, it's going to last. So the, we finished the Sermon on the Mount. Are you any wiser for it? You see, wisdom knows the difference between a sermon being finished and a sermon being done. It says that when he was through, the people said, he's got authority, yeah. He preached like he thought he was a king. And the people ought to do what he said. Let me suggest this the rest of the year. Each month, just take 20 minutes, once a month, read a sermon on the Mount and ask yourself, what do I need to put into practice? You're not going to believe this, but when car navigation systems came out, I wasn't always on board. The little voice would say, go this way, and I'd say, that's not right, I'm going that way. And inevitably, I would go down a road that led to destruction. Lostness. And then I would hear a firm voice. Recalculating route. Execute you turn And I think when we read the Sermon on the Mount, we hear the Holy Spirit saying, "Execute a U-turn. Go the way of Jesus. The way's narrow, but it's wide enough for anybody that's willing to trust and obey. Let's pray about that. And so, a lot of times, God, Jesus would say, let them have ears to hear. That's what we ask for. Because now we understand when Jesus said, have ears to hear, he didn't mean just listen to what I said. He meant do what I said. And so that's, that's what we're praying, God. That the Holy Spirit will help us listen the way Jesus said listen. And that we will be smart. Have the courage to choose the narrow way and obey King Jesus. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that we can trust every promise you made will come true. And we thank you that our future is a home that will last forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.